with God at dawn. Each morning consecrate yourself to God for that day. Surrender all your plans to Him, to be carried out or given up as His providence shall indicate. Thus day by day you may be giving your life into the hands of God, and thus your life will be molded more and more after the life of Christ. January, acquaint now thyself with Him. He is a living God. He is the true God, January 1st. But the Lord is the true God, He is the living God, and an everlasting King, at His wrath the earth shall tremble, and the nations shall not be able to abide His indignation. Like our Savior, we are in this world to do service for God. We are here to become like God in character, and by a life of service to reveal Him to the world. In order to be co-workers with God, in order to become like Him, and to reveal His character, we must know Him aright. We must know Him as He reveals Himself. A knowledge of God is the foundation of all true education and of all true service. It is the only real safeguard against temptation. It is this alone that can make us like God in character. This is the knowledge needed by all who are working for the uplifting of their fellow men. Transformation of character, purity of life, efficiency in service, adherence to correct principles, all depend upon a right knowledge of God. This knowledge is the essential preparation both for this life and for the life to come. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. Through a knowledge of Him are given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, we need to study the revelations of Himself that God has given. A clear conception of what God is and what He requires us to be, will lead to wholesome humility. He is the King Eternal, January 2nd. He is a living God. Now unto the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory for ever and ever. Amen. The revelation of Himself that God has given in His Word is for our study. This we may seek to understand. But beyond this we are not to penetrate. The highest intellect may tax itself until it is wearied out in conjectures regarding the nature of God, but the effort will be fruitless. This problem has not been given us to solve. No human mind can comprehend God. None are to indulge in speculation regarding his nature. Here silence is eloquence. The omniscient one is above discussion. Even the angels were not permitted to share the counsels between the Father and the Son when the plan of salvation was laid. And human beings are not to intrude into the secrets of the Most High. We are as ignorant of God as little children, but, as little children, we may love and obey him. Instead of speculating in regard to his nature or his prerogatives, let us give heed to the words he has spoken, Canst thou by searching find out God? Man cannot by searching find out God. Let none seek with presumptuous hand to lift the veil that conceals his glory. Unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out. It is a proof of his mercy that there is the hiding of his power for to lift the veil that conceals the Divine Presence is death. No mortal mind can penetrate the secrecy in which the Mighty One dwells and works. Only that which He sees fit to reveal can we comprehend of Him. Reason must acknowledge an authority superior to itself. Heart and intellect must bow to the Great I Am. God and Christ are one, January 3rd. He is a living God. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. As a personal being, God has revealed Himself in His Son. Jesus, the outshining of the Father's glory, and the express image of His person, was on earth found in fashion as a man. As a personal Savior, He came to the world. As a personal Savior, He ascended on high. As a personal Savior, He intercedes in the heavenly courts. Before the throne of God in our behalf ministers one like unto the Son of Man. Christ, the light of the world, veiled the dazzling splendor of His divinity, and came to live as a man among men, that they might, without being consumed, 
become acquainted with their Creator. No man has seen God at any time, except as He is revealed through Christ. I and my Father are one, Christ declared. Christ came to teach human beings what God desires them to know. In the heavens above, in the earth, in the broad waters of the ocean, we see the handiwork of God. All created things testify to His power, His wisdom, His love. But not from the stars or the ocean or the cataract can we learn of the personality of God as it is revealed in Christ. God saw that a clearer revelation than nature was needed to portray both His personality and His character. He sent His Son into the world to reveal, so far as could be endured by human sight, the nature and the attributes of the invisible God. He is the Divine Teacher, the Enlightener. Had God thought us in need of revelations other than those made through Christ, and in His written word, He would have given them. God is not a man, January 4th. He is a living God. God is not a man, that He should lie neither the Son of Man that he should repent, hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? As we learn more and more of what God is, and of what we ourselves are in his sight, we shall fear and tremble before him. He, Jesus, pointed his hearers to the ruler of the universe, under the new name, our Father. He would have them understand how tenderly the heart of God yearned over them. He teaches that God cares for every lost soul, that like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Such a conception of God was never given to the world by any religion but that of the Bible. Heathenism teaches men to look upon the Supreme Being as an object of fear rather than of love, a malign deity to be appeased by sacrifices, rather than a father pouring upon his children the gift of his love. Even the people of Israel had become so blinded to the precious teaching of the prophets concerning God, that this revelation of his paternal love was as an original subject, a new gift to the world. The Jews held that God loved those who served him, according to their view, those who fulfilled the requirements of the rabbis, and that all the rest of the world lay under his frown and curse. Not so, said Jesus, the whole world, the evil and the good lies in the sunshine of his love. God does not deal with us as finite men deal with one another. His thoughts are thoughts of mercy, love, and tenderest compassion. The Lord made the heavens, January 5th. He is a living God. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. The sun rising in the heavens is a representative of him who is the life and light of all that he has made. All the brightness and beauty that adorn the earth and light up the heavens, speak of God. All things tell of his tender, fatherly care, and of his desire to make his children happy. The mighty power that works through all nature and sustains all things is not, as some men of science represent, merely an all-pervading principle, an actuating energy. God is a spirit, yet he is a personal being, for so he has revealed himself. The Lord is the true God. He is the living God, and an everlasting King. The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth, and from under these heavens. God's handiwork in nature is not God himself in nature. The things of nature are an expression of God's character and power but we are not to regard nature as God. The artistic skill of human beings produces very beautiful workmanship, things that delight the eye, and these things reveal to us something of the thought of the designer, but the thing made is not the maker. It is not the work, but the workman, that is counted worthy of honor. So while nature is an expression of God's thought, it is not nature, but the God of nature that is to be exalted. In the creation of the earth, God was not indebted to pre-existing matter. All things, material or spiritual, stood up before the Lord Jehovah at His voice, and were created for His own purpose. God gave us an intercessor, January 6th. He is a living God. 
wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. God's appointments and grants in our behalf are without limit. The throne of grace is itself the highest attraction, because occupied by one who permits us to call him Father. But God did not deem the principle of salvation complete while invested only with his own love. By his appointment he has placed at his altar an advocate clothed with our nature. As our intercessor, his office work is to introduce us to God as his sons and daughters. Christ intercedes in behalf of those who have received him. To them he gives power, by virtue of his own merits, to become members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king. And the Father demonstrates his infinite love for Christ, who paid our ransom with his blood, by receiving and welcoming Christ's friends as his friends. He is satisfied with the atonement made. He is glorified by the incarnation, the life, death, and mediation of his Son. No sooner does the child of God approach the mercy seat than he becomes the client of the great advocate. At his first utterance of penitence and appeal for pardon, Christ espouses his case, and makes it his own, presenting the supplication before the Father as his own request. As Christ intercedes in our behalf, the Father lays open all the treasures of his grace for our appropriation, to be enjoyed and to be communicated to others. God desires his obedient children to claim his blessing, and to come before him with praise and thanksgiving. God is the fountain of life and power. We may know him, January 7th. He is a living God. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God, and eternal life. God never asks us to believe, without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. His existence, His character, the truthfulness of His word, are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason, and this testimony is abundant. Yet God has never removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity while those who really desire to know the truth, will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. The Bible unfolds truth with a simplicity and a perfect adaptation to the needs and longings of the human heart, that has astonished and charmed the most highly cultivated minds, while it enables the humble and uncultured to discern the way of salvation. And yet these simply stated truths lay hold upon subjects so elevated, so far-reaching, so infinitely beyond the power of human comprehension, that we can accept them only because God has declared them. Thus the plan of redemption is laid open to us, so that every soul may see the steps he is to take in repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, in order to be saved in God's appointed way. Yet beneath these truths, so easily understood, lie mysteries that are the hiding of his glory, mysteries that overpower the mind in its research yet inspire the sincere seeker for truth with reverence and faith. The more he searches the Bible, the deeper is his conviction that it is the word of the living God, and human reason bows before the majesty of divine revelation. The Scriptures Testify of God, January 8th Where can we find God? Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The study book of the highest value is that which contains the instruction of Christ, the teacher of teachers. The words of the living God are the highest of all education. The author of nature is the author of the Bible. Creation and Christianity have one God. God is revealed in nature, and God is revealed in His Word. In clear rays the light shines from the sacred page, showing us the living God, as represented in the laws of His government in the creation of the world, in the heavens that he has garnished. His power is to be recognized as the only means of redeeming the world from the degrading superstitions that are so dishonoring to God and man. When the Bible is made the guide and counselor, it exerts an ennobling influence upon the mind. 
Its study more than any other will refine and elevate. It will enlarge the mind of the candid student, endowing it with new impulses and fresh vigor. It will give greater efficiency to the faculties by bringing them in contact with grand, far-reaching truths. Let the Bible be received as the food of the soul, the best and most effectual means of purifying and strengthening the intellect. In God's word only do we behold the power that laid the foundations of the earth, and that stretched out the heavens. In the word of God the mind finds subjects for the deepest thought, the loftiest aspirations. Here we may hold communion with patriarchs and prophets, and listen to the voice of the Eternal as He speaks with men. The Heavens Declare His Glory, January 9th Where can we find God? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. The same power that upholds nature, is working also in man. The same great laws that guide alike the star and the atom, control human life. The laws that govern the heart's action, regulating the flow of the current of life to the body, are the laws of the mighty intelligence that has the jurisdiction of the soul. From him all life proceeds. Only in harmony with him can be found its true sphere of action. For all the objects of his creation the condition is the same, a life sustained by receiving the life of God, a life exercised in harmony with the Creator's will. To transgress his law, physical, mental, or moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe, to introduce discord, anarchy, ruin. To him who learns thus to interpret its teachings, all nature becomes illuminated. The world is a lesson book, life a school. The unity of man with nature and with God, the universal dominion of law, the results of transgression, cannot fail of impressing the mind and molding the character. So far as possible, let the child from his earliest years be placed where this wonderful lesson book shall be opened before him. Let him behold the glorious scenes painted by the great master artist upon the shifting canvas of the heavens, let him become acquainted with the wonders of earth and sea, let him watch the unfolding mysteries of the changing seasons, and, in all his works, learn of the Creator. Elijah found God in the still, small voice, January 10th. Where can we find God? And after the earthquake of fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. Not in mighty manifestations of divine power, but by a still small voice, did God choose to reveal himself to his servant. He desired to teach Elijah that it is not always the work that makes the greatest demonstration that is most successful in accomplishing his purpose. While Elijah waited for the revelation of the Lord, a tempest rolled, the lightnings flashed, and a devouring fire swept by, but God was not in all this. Then there came a still small voice, and the prophet covered his head before the presence of the Lord. His petulance was silenced, his spirit softened and subdued. He now knew that a quiet trust, a firm reliance on God, would ever find for him a present help in time of need. God speaks to us through his providential workings, and through the influence of his Spirit upon the heart. In our circumstances and surroundings, in the changes daily taking place around us, we may find precious lessons, if our hearts are but open to discern them. God speaks to us in His Word. Here we have in clear aligns the revelation of His character, of His dealings with men, and the great work of redemption. Here is open before us the history of patriarchs and prophets and other holy men of old. As we read of the precious experiences granted them, of the light and love and blessing it was theirs to enjoy, and of the work they wrought through the grace given them, the spirit that inspired them kindles a flame of holy emulation in our hearts and a desire to be like them in character, like them to walk with God. God is found in the things He made, January 11th. Where can we find God? For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead 
so that they are without excuse. In dwelling upon the laws of matter and the laws of nature, many lose sight of, if they do not deny, the continual and direct agency of God. They convey the idea that nature acts independently of God, having in and of itself its own limits and its own powers wherewith to work. In their minds there is a marked distinction between the natural and the supernatural. The natural is ascribed to ordinary causes, unconnected with the power of God. Vital power is attributed to matter, and nature is made a deity. It is supposed that matter is placed in certain relations, and left to act from fixed laws, with which God himself cannot interfere, that nature is endowed with certain properties, and placed subject to laws, and is then left to itself to obey these laws, and perform the work originally commanded. This is false science, there is nothing in the word of God to sustain it. God does not annul his laws, but he is continually working through them, using them as his instruments. They are not self-working. God is perpetually at work in nature. She is his servant, directed as he pleases. Nature in her work testifies of the intelligent presence and active agency of a being who moves in all his works according to his will. It is not by an original power inherent in nature that year by year the earth yields its bounties, and continues its march around the sun. The hand of infinite power is perpetually at work guiding this planet. It is God's power momentarily exercised that keeps it in position in its rotation. His goodness witnesses continually, January 12th. Where can we find God? Nevertheless he left not himself without witness, in that he did good, and gave us rain from heaven, and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Sin has marred earth's beauty, on all things may be seen traces of the work of evil. Yet much that is beautiful remains. Nature testifies that one infinite in power, great in goodness, mercy, and love, created the earth and filled it with life and gladness. Even in their blighted state, all things reveal the handiwork of the great master artist. Wherever we turn, we may hear the voice of God, and see evidences of his goodness. From the solemn roll of the deep-toned thunder and old ocean's ceaseless roar, to the glad songs that make the forest vocal with melody, nature's ten thousand voices speak his praise. In earth, and sea, and sky, with their marvelous tint and color, varying in gorgeous contrast or blended in harmony, we behold his glory. The everlasting hills tell us of his power. The trees that wave their green banners in the sunlight, and the flowers in their delicate beauty, point to their creator. The living green that carpets the brown earth tells of God's care for the humblest of his creatures. The caves of the sea and the depths of the earth reveal his treasures. He who placed the pearls in the ocean and the amethyst and chrysolite among the rocks, is a lover of the beautiful. The God of heaven is constantly at work. It is by his power that vegetation is caused to flourish, that every leaf appears, and every flower blooms. Every drop of rain or flake of snow, every spire of grass, every leaf and flower and shrub, testifies of God. These little things so common around us teach the lesson that, nothing is too small for his attention. They that seek his face shall find him, January 13th. Where can we find God? When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. All the powers of Satan are set in operation to hold the attention to frivolous amusements, and he is gaining his object. He is interposing his devisings between God and the soul. He will manufacture diversions to keep men from thinking about God. The world, filled with sport and pleasure-loving, is always thirsting for some new interest, but how little time and thought are given to the Creator of the heavens and the earth? God would have us study the works of infinity, and from this study learn to love and reverence and obey him. The heavens and the earth with their treasures are to teach the lessons of God's love and care and power. God calls upon his creatures to turn their attention from the confusion and perplexity around them, and admire his handiwork. 
As we study his works, angels from heaven will be by our side, to enlighten our minds, and guard them from Satan's deceptions. As you look at the wonderful things that God's hand has made, let your proud, foolish heart feel its dependence and inferiority. How terrible it is when the acknowledgement of God is not made when it should be made. How sad to humble oneself when it is too late. In the religion of Christ there is a regenerating influence that transforms the entire being, lifting man above every debasing, groveling vice, and raising the thoughts and desires toward God and heaven. Linked to the infinite one, man is made partaker of the divine nature. Upon him the shafts of evil have no effect, for he is clothed with the panoply of Christ's righteousness. God's throne is in heaven, January 14th. Where can we find God? The Lord is in his holy temple, the Lord's throne is in heaven, his eyes behold, his eyelids try, the children of men. The Bible shows us God in his high and holy place, not in a state of inactivity, not in silence and solitude, but surrounded by ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands of holy beings, all waiting to do his will. Through these messengers he is in active communication with every part of his dominion. By his spirit he is everywhere present. Through the agency of his spirit and his angels, he ministers to the children of men. Above the distractions of the earth he sits enthroned, all things are open to his divine survey, and from his great and calm eternity he orders that which his providence sees best. Our knowledge of God is partial and imperfect. When the conflict is ended, and the man Christ Jesus acknowledges before the Father his faithful workers, who in a world of sin have borne true witness for him, they will understand clearly what now are mysteries to them. Christ took with him to the heavenly courts his glorified humanity. To those who receive him he gives power to become the sons of God, that at last God may receive them as his to dwell with him throughout eternity. If during this life they are loyal to God, they will at last see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And what is the happiness of heaven but to see God? What greater joy could come to the sinner saved by the grace of Christ than to look upon the face of God, and know him as Father? We must desire to know him, January 15th. How can we know God? For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. We have no time to lose. We know not how soon our probation may close. At the longest, we have but a brief lifetime here, and we know not how soon the arrow of death may strike our hearts. We know not how soon we may be called to give up the world and all its interests. Eternity stretches before us. The curtain is about to be lifted. But a few short years, and for every one now numbered with the living the mandate will go forth, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. Are we prepared? Have we become acquainted with God, the Governor of Heaven, the Lawgiver, and with Jesus Christ whom he sent into the world as his representative? When our life work is ended, Shall we be able to say, as did Christ our example, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. I have manifested thy name? The angels of God are seeking to attract us from ourselves and from earthly things. Let them not labor in vain. The thoughts must be centered upon God. We must put forth earnest effort to overcome the evil tendencies of the natural heart. Our efforts, our self-denial and perseverance, must be proportionate to the infinite value of the object of which we are in pursuit. Only by overcoming as Christ overcame shall we win the crown of life. The knowledge of God as revealed in His Word is the knowledge to be given to our children. Let the youth make the Word of God the food of mind and soul. We must seek Him, January 16th. How can we know God? I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Although God dwells not in temples made with hands, yet he honors with his presence the assemblies of his people. 
He has promised that when they come together to seek Him, to acknowledge their sins, and to pray for one another, He will meet with them by His Spirit. But those who assemble to worship Him should put away every evil thing. Unless they worship Him in spirit and truth and in the beauty of holiness, their coming together will be of no avail. We must turn away from a thousand topics that invite attention. There are matters that consume time and arouse inquiry, but end in nothing. The highest interests demand the close attention and energy that are so often given to comparatively insignificant things. What think ye of Christ? This is the all-important question. Do you receive Him as a personal Savior? To all who receive Him He gives power to become sons of God. Christ revealed God to His disciples in a way that performed in their hearts a special work, such as He desires to do in our hearts. There are many who, in dwelling too largely upon theory, have lost sight of the living power of the Savior's example. They have lost sight of Him as the humble, self-denying worker. What they need is to behold Jesus. Daily we need the fresh revealing of His presence. We need to follow more closely His example of self-renunciation and self-sacrifice. The knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ expressed in character is an exaltation above everything else that is esteemed on earth or in heaven. We must believe, January 17th. How can we know God? Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established, believe His prophets, so shall ye prosper. The whole Bible is a revelation of the glory of God in Christ. Received, believed, obeyed, it is the great instrumentality in the transformation of character. It is the grand stimulus, the constraining force, that quickens the physical, mental, and spiritual powers, and directs the life into right channels. The reason why the youth, and even those of mature years, are so easily led into temptation and sin, is that they do not study the Word of God, and meditate upon it, as they should. The lack of firm, decided willpower, which is manifest in life and character, results from neglect of the sacred instruction of God's Word. They do not by earnest effort direct the mind to that which would inspire pure, holy thought, and divert it from that which is impure and untrue. There are few who choose the better part, who sit at the feet of Jesus, as did Mary to learn of the Divine Teacher. Few treasure His words in the heart, and practice them in the life. The truths of the Bible, received, will uplift mind and soul. If the Word of God were appreciated as it should be, both young and old would possess an inward rectitude, a strength of principle, that would enable them to resist temptation. We must set our hearts to know what is truth. All the lessons which God has caused to be placed on record in His Word are for our warning and instruction. They are given to save us from deception. Their neglect will result in ruin to ourselves. Whatever contradicts God's Word, we may be sure proceeds from Satan. Through the Holy Spirit, January 18th How can we know God? He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. The Holy Spirit exalts and glorifies the Savior. It is His office to present Christ, the purity of His righteousness, and the great salvation that we have through Him. The Spirit of Truth is the only effectual teacher of divine truth. How must God esteem the human race, since He gave His Son to die for them, and appoints His Spirit to be man's teacher and continual guide? Before offering himself as the sacrificial victim, Christ sought for the most essential and complete gift to bestow upon his followers, a gift that would bring within their reach the boundless resources of grace. Before this the Spirit had been in the world, from the very beginning of the work of redemption he had been moving upon men's hearts. But while Christ was on earth, the disciples had desired no other helper. Not until they were deprived of his presence would they feel their need of the Spirit and then he would come. The Holy Spirit is Christ's representative, but divested of the personality of humanity, and independent thereof. Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore it was for their interest that he should go to the Father, 
and send the spirit to be his successor on earth. No one could then have any advantage because of his location or his personal contact with Christ. By the spirit the Savior would be accessible to all. In this sense he would be nearer to them than if he had not ascended on high. Wherever we are, wherever we may go, he is always at our right hand to support, sustain, uphold, and cheer. Taste and See, January 19th How can we know God? O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Thus through faith they will come to know God by an experimental knowledge. They have proved for themselves the reality of his word, the truth of his promises. They have tasted, and they know that the Lord is good. The beloved John had a knowledge gained through his own experience. So every one may be able, through his own experience, to set his seal to this, that God is true. He can bear witness to that which he himself has seen and heard and felt of the power of Christ. He can testify, I needed help, and I found it in Jesus. Every want was supplied, the hunger of my soul was satisfied, the Bible is to me the revelation of Christ. I believe in Jesus because he is to me a divine Savior. I believe the Bible because I have found it to be the voice of God to my soul. It is our privilege to reach higher and still higher, for clearer revealings of the character of God. When Moses prayed, I beseech thee, show me thy glory, the Lord did not rebuke him, but he granted his prayer. God declared to his servant, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and will proclaim the name of Jehovah before thee. It is sin that darkens our minds and dims our perceptions. As sin is purged from our hearts, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, illuminating his word and reflected from the face of nature, more and more fully will declare him merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. In his light shall we see light, until mind and heart and soul are transformed into the image of his holiness. The earth is full of his goodness, January 20th. How can we know God? He loveth righteousness and judgment, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. From the stars that in their trackless course through space, follow from age to age their appointed path, down to the minutest atom, the things of nature obey the Creator's will. He who upholds the unnumbered worlds throughout immensity, at the same time cares for the wants of the little brown sparrow that sings its humble song without a fear. When men go forth to their daily toil, as when they engage in prayer, when they lie down at night, and when they rise in the morning, when the rich man feasts in his palace, or when the poor man gathers his children about the scanty board, each is tenderly watched by the Heavenly Father. God is constantly employed in upholding and using as his servants the things that he has made. He works through the laws of nature, using them as his instruments. They are not self-acting. Nature and her work testifies of the intelligent presence and active agency of a being who moves in all things according to his will. It is not by inherent power that year by year the earth yields its bounties, and continues its march around the sun. The hand of the Infinite One is perpetually at work guiding this planet. It is God's power continually exercised that keeps the earth in position in its rotation. It is God who causes the sun to rise in the heavens. He opens the windows of heaven and gives rain. It is by his power that vegetation is caused to flourish, that every leaf appears, every flower blooms, every fruit develops. We must study his works, January 21st. How can we know God? For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works! And thy thoughts are very deep. Many are the ways in which God is seeking to make himself known to us and bring us into communion with him. Nature speaks to our senses without ceasing. The open heart will be impressed with the love and glory of God as revealed through the works of his hands. The listening ear can hear and understand the communications of God through the things of nature. 
The green fields, the lofty trees, the buds and flowers, the passing cloud, the falling rain, the babbling brook, the glories of the heavens, speak to our hearts, and invite us to become acquainted with Him who made them all. Our Savior bound up His precious lessons with the things of nature. The trees, the birds, the flowers of the valleys, the hills, the lakes, and the beautiful heavens, as well as the incidents and surroundings of daily life, were all linked with the words of truth, that His lessons might thus be often recalled to mind, even amid the busy cares of man's life of toil. God would have His children appreciate His works, and delight in the simple, quiet beauty with which He has adorned our earthly home. He is a lover of the beautiful, and above all that is outwardly attractive He loves beauty of character, He would have us cultivate purity and simplicity, the quiet graces of the flowers. If we will but listen, God's created works will teach us precious lessons of obedience and trust. No tears are shed that God does not notice. There is no smile that he does not mark. God hath chosen us to save us, January 22nd. What is God's purpose for us? But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. It is through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth that we become laborers together with God. Christ waits for the cooperation of His Church. He does not design to add a new element of efficiency to His Word. He has done His great work in giving His inspiration to the Word. The blood of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Divine Word, are ours. The object of all this provision of heaven is before us, the salvation of the souls for whom Christ died, and it depends upon us to lay hold on the promises God has given and become laborers together with Him. Divine and human agencies must cooperate in the work. Having stood in the counsels of God, having dwelt in the everlasting heights of the sanctuary, all elements of truth were in Him and of Him. He was one with God. It means more than finite minds can comprehend to present in every missionary effort Christ and Him crucified. Christ risen from the dead, Christ ascended on high as our intercessor, this is the science of salvation that we need to learn and to teach. In his efforts to reach God's ideal for him, the Christian is to despair of nothing. Moral and spiritual perfection, through the grace and power of Christ, is promised to all. Jesus is the source of power, the fountain of life. He leads us to the throne of God, and puts into our mouth a prayer through which we are brought into close contact with Himself. In our behalf He sets in operation the all-powerful agencies of heaven. We must fear and serve the Lord, January 23rd. What is God's purpose for us? Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, Him shalt thou serve and to him shalt thou cleave, and swear by his name. It is God's purpose to manifest through his people the principles of his kingdom. That in life and character they may reveal these principles, he desires to separate them from the customs, habits, and practices of the world. He seeks to bring them near to himself, that he may make known to them his will. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, God brought out the Hebrew hosts from the land of bondage. Wonderful was the deliverance he wrought for them, punishing their enemies, who refused to listen to his word, with total destruction. God desired to take his people apart from the world, and prepare them to receive his word. From Egypt he led them to Mount Sinai, where he revealed to them his glory. Here was nothing to attract their senses or divert their minds from God and as the vast multitude looked at the lofty mountains towering above them, they could realize their own nothingness in the sight of God. Beside these rocks, immovable except by the power of the divine will, God communicated with men. And that His word might ever be clear and distinct in their minds, He proclaimed amid thunder and lightning and with terrible majesty the law which He had given in Eden, and which was the transcript of His character and the words were written on tables of stone by the finger of God. Thus the will of the infinite God was revealed to a people who were called to make known to every nation, K. 
kindred, and tongue the principles of his government in heaven and in earth. To the same work he has called his people in this generation. To them he has revealed his will, and of them he requires obedience. We must work out our own salvation, January 24th. What is God's purpose for us? Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The Christian life is a battle and a march. But the victory to be gained is not won by human power. The field of conflict is the domain of the heart. The battle which we have to fight, the greatest battle that was ever fought by man, is the surrender of self to the will of God, the yielding of the heart to the sovereignty of love. The old nature, born of blood and of the will of the flesh, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The hereditary tendencies, the former habits, must be given up. He who determines to enter the spiritual kingdom will find that all the powers and passions of an unregenerate nature, backed by the forces of the kingdom of darkness, are arrayed against him. Selfishness and pride will make a stand against anything that would show them to be sinful. We cannot, of ourselves, conquer the evil desires and habits that strive for the mastery. We cannot overcome the mighty foe who holds us in his thrall. God alone can give us the victory. He desires us to have the mastery over ourselves, our own will and ways. But He cannot work in us without our consent and cooperation. The Divine Spirit works through the faculties and powers given to man. Our energies are required to cooperate with God. The victory is not won without much earnest prayer, without the humbling of self at every step. Our will is not to be forced into cooperation with divine agencies but it must be voluntarily submitted. We must have love for others, January 25th. What is God's purpose for us? Thou shall love thy neighbor as thyself. The law of love calls for the devotion of body, mind, and soul to the service of God and our fellow men. And this service, while making us a blessing to others, brings the greatest blessing to ourselves. Unselfishness underlies all true development. Through unselfish service we receive the highest culture of every faculty. More and more fully do we become partakers of the divine nature. We are fitted for heaven, for we receive heaven into our hearts. It is a wicked pride that delights in the vanity of one's own works, that boasts of one's excellent qualities, seeking to make others seem inferior in order to exalt self claiming more glory than the cold heart is willing to give to God. The disciples of Christ will heed the Master's instruction. He has bidden us love one another even as He has loved us. Religion is founded upon love to God, which also leads us to love one another. It is full of gratitude, humility, long-suffering. It is self-sacrificing, forbearing, merciful, and forgiving. It sanctifies the whole life and extends its influence over others. Those who love God cannot harbor hatred or envy. When the heavenly principle of eternal love fills the heart, it will flow out to others, not merely because favors are received of them, but because love is the principle of action, and modifies the character, governs the impulses, controls the passions, subdues enmity, and elevates and ennobles the affections. This love is not contracted so as merely to include me and mine, but is as broad as the world, and as high as heaven, and is in harmony with that of the angel workers. We are to point men to Jesus, January 26. What is God's purpose for us? Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. There is a great work to be done and every effort possible must be made to reveal Christ as the sin-pardoning Savior, Christ as the sin-bearer, Christ as the bright and morning star, and the Lord will give us favor before the world until our work is done. While the angels hold the four winds, we are to work with all our capabilities. We must bear our message without any delay. We must give evidence to the heavenly universe, and to men in this degenerate age, 
that our religion is a faith and a power of which Christ is the author, and his word the divine oracle. Human souls are hanging in the balance. They will either be subjects for the kingdom of God or slaves to the despotism of Satan. All are to have the privilege of laying hold of the hope set before them in the gospel, and how can they hear without a preacher? The human family is in need of a moral renovation, a preparation of character, that they may stand in God's presence. There are souls ready to perish because of the theoretical errors which are prevailing, and which are calculated to counterwork the gospel message. There is no work in our world so great, so sacred, and so glorious, no work that God honors so much, as this gospel work. The message presented at this time is the last message of mercy for a fallen world. Those who have the privilege of hearing this message, and who persist in refusing to heed the warning, cast away their last hope of salvation. There will be no second probation. The word of truth, it is written, is the gospel we are to preach. No flaming sword is placed before this tree of life. All who will may partake of it. We must seek wisdom, January 27th. What is God's purpose for us? Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. Since God is the source of all true knowledge, it is, as we have seen, the first object of education to direct our minds to his own revelation of himself. Adam and Eve received knowledge through direct communion with God, and they learned of him through his works. All created things, in their original perfection, were an expression of the thought of God. To Adam and Eve nature was teeming with divine wisdom. But by transgression man was cut off from learning of God through direct communion, and to a great degree, through his works. The earth, marred and defiled by sin, reflects but dimly the Creator's glory. It is true that his object lessons are not obliterated. Upon every page of the great volume of his created works may still be traced his handwriting. Nature still speaks of her Creator. Yet these revelations are partial and imperfect. And in our fallen state, with weakened powers and restricted vision, we are incapable of interpreting aright. We need the fuller revelation of himself that God has given in his written word. To obtain an education worthy of the name, we must receive a knowledge of God, the Creator, and of Christ, the Redeemer, as they are revealed in the sacred word. Instead of confining their study to that which men have said or written, let students be directed to the sources of truth, to the vast fields open for research in nature and revelation. Let them contemplate the great facts of duty and destiny, and the mind will expand and strengthen. The Challenge of a Mighty Work, January 28th What is God's purpose for us? Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations, spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. God's people have a mighty work before them, a work that must continually rise to greater prominence. Our efforts in missionary lines must become far more extensive. A more decided work than has been done must be done prior to the second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. God's people are not to cease their labors until they shall encircle the world. The vineyard includes the whole world, and every part of it is to be worked. There are places which are now a moral wilderness, and these are to become as the garden of the Lord. The waste places of the earth are to be cultivated, that they may bud and blossom as the rose. New territories are to be worked by men inspired by the Holy Spirit. New churches must be established, new congregations organized. At this time there should be representatives of present truth in every city, and in the remote parts of the earth. The whole earth is to be illuminated with the glory of God's truth. The light is to shine to all lands and all peoples. And it is from those who have received the light that it is to shine forth. The day star has risen upon us, and we are to flash its light upon the pathway of those in darkness. A crisis is right upon us. We must now by the Holy Spirit's power proclaim the great truths for these last days. 
It will not be long before everyone will have heard the warning and made his decision. Then shall the end come. It is the very essence of all right faith to do the right thing at the right time. God is the great master worker, and by his providence he prepares the way for his work to be accomplished. Hold fast the word, January 29th. What is our response? Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. The Lord has often made manifest in his providence that nothing less than revealed truth, the word of God, can reclaim man from sin or keep him from transgression. That word which reveals the guilt of sin, has a power upon the human heart to make man right and keep him so. The Lord has said that his word is to be studied and obeyed, it is to be brought into the practical life, that word is as inflexible as the character of God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. But however much one may advance in spiritual life, he will never come to a point where he will not need diligently to search the scriptures, for therein are found the evidences of our faith. All points of doctrine, even though they have been accepted as truth, should be brought to the law and to the testimony, if they cannot stand this test, there is no light in them. The great plan of redemption, as revealed in the closing work for these last days, should receive close examination. The scenes connected with the sanctuary above should make such an impression upon the minds and hearts of all that they may be able to impress others. All need to become more intelligent in regard to the work of the atonement, which is going on in the sanctuary above. By study, contemplation, and prayer, God's people will be elevated above common, earthly thoughts and feelings, and will be brought into harmony with Christ and His great work of cleansing the sanctuary above from the sins of the people. Lay a True Foundation, January 30th What is our response? According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Those who have trained the mind to delight in spiritual exercises, are the ones who can be translated and not be overwhelmed with the purity and transcendent glory of heaven. You may have a good knowledge of the arts, you may have an acquaintance with the sciences, you may excel in music and in penmanship, your manners may please your associates, but what have these things to do with a preparation for heaven? What have they to do to prepare you to stand before the tribunal of God? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Nothing but holiness will prepare you for heaven. It is sincere experimental piety alone that can give you a pure, elevated character, and enable you to enter into the presence of God, who dwelleth in light unapproachable. The heavenly character must be acquired on earth, or it can never be acquired at all. Then begin at once. Flatter not yourself that a time will come when you can make an earnest effort easier than now. Every day increases your distance from God. Prepare for eternity with such zeal as you have not yet manifested. Educate your mind to love the Bible, to love the prayer meeting, to love the hour of meditation, and above all, the hour when the soul communes with God. Become heavenly minded if you would unite with the heavenly choir in the mansions above. Seek Righteousness, January 31st What is our response? Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If you have a sense of need in your soul, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, this is an evidence that Christ has wrought upon your heart, in order that he may be sought unto to do for you, through the endowment of the Holy Spirit, those things which it is impossible for you to do for yourself. We need not seek to quench our thirst at shallow streams, for the great fountain is just above us, of whose abundant waters we may freely drink, if we will rise a little higher in the pathway of faith. The words of God are the wellsprings of life. As you seek unto those living springs, you will, through the Holy Spirit, be brought into communion with Christ. Familiar truths will present themselves to your mind in a new aspect, 
texts of scripture will burst upon you with a new meaning, as a flash of light, you will see the relation of other truths to the work of redemption, and you will know that Christ is leading you, a divine teacher is at your side. The sense of unworthiness will lead the heart to hunger and thirst for righteousness, and this desire will not be disappointed. Those who make room in their hearts for Jesus will realize his love. All who long to bear the likeness of the character of God shall be satisfied. The Holy Spirit never leaves unassisted the soul who is looking unto Jesus. He takes of the things of Christ and shows them unto him. If the eye is kept fixed on Christ, the work of the Spirit ceases not until the soul is conformed to his image.